I, I like the, um, the word journey when, when you talk about discovery of olive oil. And I think that chefs should be made aware of if, if they're not already, that there is a range of flavors that's, that can be found in olive oil that comes from the, the, the variety and, and the way the oil was processed and then stored. And if we think about the flavor map for olive oil, I mean, think about four different corners that would represent um, the, the four different styles that, that you find in, in olive oil. And that would be the, the ripe, fruity style, the, the green, fruity, um, robust, so green, bitter, and, and pungent style. Let me start over. If we think about a flavor map for olive oil, it can best be illustrated as a diamond or an ellipse with four corners, which represent the ripe fruity, uh, green fruity, robust, that is uh, green, bitter, and pungent, and then defective types. Those would be the four, four types of flavor profiles we need to, to be exposed to when it comes to olive oil. And when we talk about defective oils, we talk about oils that are rancid, Fusty, that have muddy sediment characters that are whiny, et cetera. So through trying different kinds of olive oils, we should all become aware of those four different corners that we remark for olive oils. And so from here, I would say that if we agree that olive oil is, is one of the most desirable fats that we can work with because it's healthy, sustainable, and delicious, except when it's defective then it follows that it might make sense to take advantage of that flavor diversity and express it when we cook uh, with the understanding and the caveats that olive oil remains an ingredient with which we cook or, or a condiment rather than a standalone food or, or beverage. And that the extent of cooking or the way we, we work with olive oil will influence that expression and that the combination of olive oil and foods will work more or less well, just as food and, and wine pairing follows some fairly well um, and well understood and accepted principle. So those are the things that, um, that we would want to consider in maximizing the exposure of chefs to different types of olive oils and, and coming to understand that the expression of these different sensory profiles is, is going to change depending on how we use the oils. So when you talk about the range of flavor that can be found in, in olive oil, um, you mentioned the variety and the way that olive oil um, was processed and stored. So what do you think about another element that, in my opinion, it's very important, and maybe we will talk about it later on in depth, but that is called the terroir. So I... I think terroir is still a still a, a bit of a of a stretch for olive oil producers because unlike wine, I mean we, we do have a good understanding of which olive varieties are gonna grow best in specific terroirs that we find find around the Mediterranean. So we we can replicate those or look for similar terroirs when we we're in the new world and we're thinking about planting uh, olive trees. But um, we, we're not at the same stage as where we are with wine, for example, where we can really express specific flavor profiles for specific wine varieties by manipulating or by playing with terroir elements. So I think the, this is still a fairly new word for, for the olive oil world, but one that should definitely be taken advantage of. I totally agree, and maybe we will talk about it later on. So if we think about a sensory map for olive oils um, and setting aside defective olive oils, which would be things that are rancid or fast, have muddy sediment characters or are whiny. So if we set those aside, and there are plenty of them, by the way, but if we do that and we focus on, on olive oils with, uh, which are truly extra virgin, and have uh, positive sensory traits, um, we can classify them under four different general types, uh, which you can conveniently lay out in, a, in four different quadrants in, in, a, in a map. And those would be 
first the what we call the ripe fruit, nutty, buttery style. Uh, second would be uh, green, grassy, but fairly mild and delicate. Third would be uh, a stronger green, grassy, uh, green type of fruit and, and grassy uh, flavors. And then the fourth category would be the truly robust olive oil, which, which would be green fruity, but also bitter and sometimes pungent. So those are the, uh, the four different uh, categories that uh, we might use when we think about, about uh, high quality olive oils. And you know, an exercise that's gonna work well in terms of becoming familiar with, uh, with those different flavor profiles and, and really realizing the possibilities because of that diversity would be to, to gather a, a bunch of, um, of different olive oils. You might have to, to buy some, some, uh, some pricey olive oils from, from, uh, from both the, the Mediterranean and, and the New World, and then do some kind of sorting exercise and, and try to put these different oils into those four different categories. Is this oil kind of... Uh, ripe, fruity, more on the nutty and buttery side, or is it quite bitter and pungent? Or is it a mild, delicate, with, uh, with beautiful, fruity, floral, and, and green, green fruit uh, notes? And what, once you've done that, then, then you, you, you've set yourself up for uh, then playing with different, these different profiles and introducing them into the way you cook and then pairing them with, into specific dishes. Talking about the technique that we have used and that we use at Villa Campestri and the Oliotheca Villa Campestri to educate chefs and uh, restaurant guests about the range of flavor in extra virgin olive oil. Well, we use completely different approach. Uh, with chef, we use the rule, less is more. In fact, chefs are stimulated in decreasing the attention on technique and tools since they are very focused in technique and tools in general and uh, we ask them to focus more on each ingredient and um, increasing in this way the sensory um, evaluation the specific sensory evaluation so giving to the product that the value it deserves and uh, here it comes the epiphany so the epiphany is actually when the technique and the tools decrease and the attention on a specific element on a specific in ingredients are brought up increase for guests it's completely different most of our guests are not Italian, they come from all over the world, so they are uh, more or less used to uh, olive oil. But what I have found is that actually people can't really recognize good olive oil from bad, uh, defective, uh, let's say, olive oil. So during our session of olive oil tasting, we propose always always one highly defective olive oil and three excellent uh, olive oils. So what happened that they first smell at the highly defective olive oil and then they smell a very grassy and flavorful uh, olive oil and here it comes the epiphany. So it's the big uh, uh, wow uh, effect that comes immediately right away. So you don't really need to talk a lot it's like you know immediate so they can experience firsthand the difference between a defective olive oil and a good one and most of them if not all of them they say that this is a transformative experience um, what we do in the restaurant so for people who's not will who's not willing to actually follow any olive oil the tasting session, but they just want to savor, you know, to, to sit at the restaurant and have the experience of the olive oil tasting. Well, we serve three different types of excellent olive oil and they can play with this olive oil and their food. Or 
we can do something different. And this is a totally different experience. What we serve is three samples of the same food, like for instance, beef tartare. So we actually organize the dishes in, you know, mm, uh, giving them three beef tartare, exactly the same. And then they can play with olive oil, adding the three different sensory profile on the same beef tartare. So that's what we do. And the epiphany comes. <laughs> After um, tasting um, a good, excellent uh, olive oil, the wow effect is there. But um, people at times is very surprised that olive oil has pungent and uh, um, spicy um, reaction. So they, they actually think that uh, um, pungency and spiciness is not something positive and they uh, attribute these to negative attributes. And what I explained them is that it's totally the contrary. So that are the polyphenols that actually are the good stuff of the olive oil that makes these uh, happen. And um, this, this is quite surprising for me because being, uh, you know, uh, an Italian lady uh, and used to good olive oil, um, we always tasted this pungent and this bitterness as the best of the best, but the rest of the world considered this to be kind of frightening. So they, they believe that actually um, decay olive oil or defective olive oil has this taste and flavor. So once you explain them why uh, they should appreciate uh, this kind of olive oil, pungent, robust, uh, um, uh, spicy, they realize that what they always had been thought till this moment, you know, was wrong. And so this is another epiphany. Um, during the olive oil session, a session uh, in the Olioteca, we taste the olive oil right away without any kind of bread or potato, nothing. Uh, but then in the restaurant, we use the same olive oil with food. And that makes uh, the whole experience complete. Because once you add with uh, uh, cannellini beans, for instance, or with uh, plain potatoes, everything changed. And um, this is another uh, wow effect that actually really makes them happy. The reason why I, I want to push back on that is because you know, consumers will go with, um, with what their senses tell them. And uh, from, an, um, from a flavor preference perspective, we are wired to like fat, fat sugar, and salt, but uh, also to dislike or stay away from things that are bitter or, or pungent. And so we're going to innately reject those. Um, now, when it comes to aromas or, or factory notes, we learn to like or dislike different uh, flavors based on, on exposure. So we can, we can expose somebody to a high, high quality green, grassy, tomato leaf type of olive oil and get them to like that. But the bitterness and the pungency is something that their body, their senses are telling them, yeah, you know, I'm not too crazy about that. So yeah. I think we really need to consider that when, we, when we're trying to, uh, to categorize high quality olive oils um, and, and respect the fact that different consumers are going to like different things. I totally agree with you. Yes. And, and, and also what comes, comes along with that is um, because you, most people have been exposed to defective oils, rancid and fusty oils for, for so long. They've learned to like these oils based on, on exposure. So it's, it's important to give them that experience of the defective and then the high quality oil next to it so that they can leave that defective world behind and move to the, to the high quality one. Um, yeah, absolutely. In fact, the, the question is, uh, where am I going to buy now the good, excellent olive oil that you're serving? And I always answer the same thing. The world is full of excellent olive oil, so there's no problem. 
of course, we serve different type of uh, olive oil based on different range of complexity. Um, there's a, a very robust uh, olive oil and two milder olive oil with completely different sensory profiles. And in general, uh, what people like is much more milder olive oil compared to the robust uh, olive oil. Not only during the session of the olive oil tasting, but also afterwards when they go into the restaurant, they uh, you know um, try they, they they savor the olive oil with food. Well, in general, robust olive oil. Um, are less accepted than uh, milder olive oil. That's for sure. When, whenever you combine robust olive oil with, uh, and that's why I stopped because actually robust food is uh, beef <laughs> that we start with. Um, so can I mention that? It's, it, it's true. I mean, they accept the, the robust olive oil when it's not overwhelming. That that's the major thing when it's not overwhelming, and so you 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 combine uh, with robust food, uh, with for instance the beef, then they accept that. But in other cases, they don't. They they really don't. They they dislike uh, very pungent and uh, robust olive oil. All of them. I can I can see from their eyes. You know, I mean. They, you explain that those are uh, excellent olive oil because blah, 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 they have lots of uh, polyphenols, that, but eventually they don't really like it. So, it's, Gemma, isn't it primarily because they're surprised they just don't expect that in olive oil, right? Si, 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 è vero, è vero. This is true, absolutely. So that could be another point. So maybe they dislike it because it's, the first time they taste it and uh, and so yeah people it's kind of um, i don't know how to say it, but uh, they 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 need time you know to digest uh, they need time to um, to get used to something um and probably even even in flavor is the same i mean probably it's it's true i mean some very high super uh guests that keep coming actually i can tell that they they like our profile right. they really like it but mm, most of the most of the guests go out with the bag of uh, lago di garda olive oil i i'm hon honest i mean i i i don't i don't blame them because it's uh, a typical strong Tuscan robust olive oil and you really need to be used to it right so I mean you you know guys I mean probably it was your experience right so you 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 were like what, what, what's going on in here people start coughing and they they start there start crying you started <laughs> crying like <laughs> crazy yeah but you know there, there's something that I would like to mention that um we might be able to, to use later in the conversation. So think about trends in, in cooking these days and, and, and the kinds of ethnic cuisines that are starting to, to appear everywhere. And we've gone from thinking that either people like uh, spicy foods a lot or that they dislike them very much. And we, we're now moving away from this all or none type of attitude about spiciness in foods to say a little bit of spiciness, uh, spicy ingredients are going to add complexity to the dish. So because of the spiciness level of, of those robust olive oils, I mean, they're pungent, but they are not super pungent like, like some types of, of peppers, Certo. that there is a, a huge opportunity to use those types of olive oils into uh, a range of dishes just to add complexity to those dishes and and create something that's not mild and something that's not very pungent either once it's in the dish right so there is a nice angle for um for chefs to play with robust olive oils don't forget that that the oil by itself to the consumer is just going to be a, a bit startling so in our restaurant, we serve a range, a range of uh, olive oil. Um, I will do it again. 
sorry. In our restaurant, we serve a range of olive oil that goes from the robust uh, olive oil to the mild olive oil. Um, and people um, is really impressed by uh, the fact that robust olive oil match very well with some vegetables, for instance, the cannellini beans, or incredibly with a chocolate souffle, a hot chocolate souffle that we uh, make in our kitchen. And uh, the milder olive oil, of course, go goes very well with the fish and with uh, a wide range of vegetables. And of course, the robust olive oil goes very well as well on vegetables, but especially if they're grilled, so um, that the olive oil, the robust olive oil, do not overwhelm uh, the food. So what goes into the concept of lifestyle are um, several types of values, such as, for instance, tradition, culture, that to me are the most important value. And um, of course, there's um, other values like time. Time is a value. Then sustainability is another important value. Then uh, interest. You know, because uh, actually olive oil brings up interest. And uh, with olive oil, you have a continuous cycle of birth and rebirth. And of course, it's true that in, in wine, for instance, is exactly the same because you make wine every year. Um, but what really makes a huge difference be between wine and olive oil is that um, wine get better with age. And olive oil followed the rule, the fresher, the better. So um, another concept that is very important into, uh, that fits very well actually into the lifestyle concept it, is that olive oil is opening because necessarily need to combine with other foods. So it open your mind to actually combine uh, the, 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 the product, the olive oil, with something else. So um, if you think that uh, our um, land <laughs> is uh, full of uh, uh, tradition and culture, um, it, it's very easy to combine it with uh, uh, a, a good lifestyle, right? And sometimes lifestyle uh, cannot be combined in other, you know, part of the world because mm, it's very hard to apply a certain lifestyle in a particular part of the world, but there's uh, specific uh, places, uh, well, where actually uh, this lifestyle can go very well. And I believe that California is, for instance, one of these because the climate is very similar to Italy. The uh, olive trees grows very well in California. And so, probably we may apply this kind of lifestyle even in certain parts of, of the world, which is not uh, uh, Italy. So um, mm, most of the time people is really scared about the word fat, you know, so um, mm, people do not like to think that uh, olive oil is a fat, but it's a fat, it's a liquid fat, it's a gold fat. Um, so to me, what is most important part of the story is educate, and I know that Jean Xavier do not like this, uh, this word, to educate people not to demonize uh, this fat and uh, explain that it's healthy, that it's uh, sustainable, and that it's delicious. So that, so let, let, let me add to that, and going back to the question of how, how do you experience the olive oil lifestyle or the, the Mediterranean lifestyle? Because when we think about the Mediterranean diet, we should also think about the Mediterranean lifestyle. I, I think it's, it's hard to reproduce that olive oil lifestyle unless we all move to Tuscany or to Crete or to Andalusia. But, but California is probably the, the place where, we, where it might happen. And it's because, as, as I used to, to discuss with, uh, with Gemma's dad, with, uh, with Paolo Pasquali, you can draw a parallel between the Renaissance in, in Tuscany, in Florence, and then what's what's happening in, 
in, in Silicon Valley, you, you've got some of the same spirit that, that put together that, that, that Renaissance uh, period. And so if there is a place where we can both innovate and embrace new concepts related to olive oil and, and its use in cooking, it's, it's definitely California. Something which is very different from the way we use olive oil compared to the way uh, other European or Americans use olive oil is that we use it in a very in, in incredible amount compared to a few drops here and there. This is because it's something that we have seen in our culture, we have seen in our childhood, so we do what our grandparents do, what our parents do. And uh, this is something related to a very specific need of uh, feeding uh, our body, because actually uh, olive oil, um, it's true that it, it combines very well with, with food, but you have to consider that um, after the Second World War, Italy was a very poor country, you know, so um, olive oil would give uh, an incredible source of energy. If you consider that one gram of olive oil has double of the energy of a gram of sugar, then you really f put that into um, uh, a very important uh, um, uh, food supplier. It's, it's, it's giving you lots of uh, energy. Mm, and Romans did know did did know very well because before you know starting la crociata uh, towards Iran, they would like uh, uh, eat lots of olive oil because that was the source of energy, you know, to walk and to fight and to uh, uh, actually win the war. So. Um, it's really important for us to add a lot of olive oil on our dishes because first of all, we are used to it. And second of all, it, it, it's our source of uh, uh, energy. Gemma, one thing I, I would like to pick up on is, um, is, is something that, that gets to be an obstacle outside the Mediterranean and, and it's the fact that a high quality olive oil is gonna be quite pricey. So let's say you're, you're cooking in Spain or in Italy, and for five euros, you can get a pretty pretty nice bottle of olive oil, and that's why you're gonna use it abundantly. If you have to pay 20 or, or $30 uh, for a bottle of, of high quality olive oil, you're going to be a bit more cautious uh, about sprinkling it on everything or cooking with it and so on. And so we, so we need to get past that uh, so that people realize that uh, just like they're willing to, to put some money into a nice cup of coffee or a nice bottle of wine, they should do the same with, uh, with olive oil. Oh, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a spoiled person, right? Because I, we are producer of olive oil. So I, um, I really um, see you these from... <laughs> Yeah, I, I take it for granted, of course, and I see this from a completely different uh, uh, perspective. Um, of course, we don't waste uh, uh, olive oil. We really use it for everything, even for frying. And I completely agree that a family of four um, people, you know, probably is not able to afford, you know. But this is the, the big challenge of um, trying to make uh, a very good olive oil for, uh, you know, a uh, fair price. So this is uh, what uh, we are trying to, all, all of us are trying to move forward. So we have to move forward. Well, you know very well, because in California, you're producing excellent olive oil, trying to reduce incredibly the cost. And uh, this is the super high density, right? The olive culture, which is making uh, an incredible um, um, breakthrough in the market. And so I totally agree with you. Uh, I see that from my perspective and the explanation why Italians do it in the way we do is exactly what I said. So we come from a very poor tradition. Um, 
and olive oil was a great source of energy. But of course, we have to move forward and we really need to um, focus on what you said. So put olive oil in another perspective and uh, absolutely consider uh, that to be a super fantastic, super Tuscan uh, bottle of wine or you know, another specific food, very expensive food that you like. So we, we've been talking about the olive oil lifestyle in the, the Mediterranean context, but I think we also want to make the point that that's a lifestyle that can be had anywhere around the world these days because of the, the new world has started producing some really high quality olive oils and it's begun to, to, to incorporate olive oil into, into its cuisine and its, um, its culture. So yes, it's easy to have that olive oil lifestyle in, in Tuscany or, or in Provence, but, but you can also um, have it in California, in Chile, or in Scandinavia, Germany, or, or the US, because um, it's being produced over there. And it's also uh, an offering as, as a top source of, um, of, of high quality, sustainable, and, and really delicious uh, fat. No, you go. I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. You can apply the same lifestyle everywhere. I mean, it's really up to you. It's really up to your uh, intention of making the olive oil the heart of your cuisine and your cooking and your life. So as you're doing probably with the many other ingredients of your kitchen, you know, it's like... Um, paying attention to many details. And olive oil, of course, is one of the most important. It, it might be just as important to explore, um, meaning taste and cook with, a range of olive oil as it is to expand its, its culinary applications. I, I do like the, the drizzling of an olive oil on just about everything. And I've tried to spread a, a lemma of, as the olive oil, not the salt, um, because to reduce sodium consumption, to raise awareness of olive oil's flavor, diversity, and, and culinary potential, and to enhance uh, olive oil consumption, we, we can do that. Um, the flavor of the dish will change for sure, as the aromas and taste of the oil will combine with those of the, uh, of the dish in unique ways. So but bread dipping uh, into, into olive oil is, is a good way to start tasting the flavor diversity of olive oils. Then drizzle it generously on everything and, and see what, what is a hit for you and what is not. Uh, try different combinations if possible to figure out that ideal olive oil food pairing. And now for chefs, explore different oils with different sauces, different ways of cooking with the olive oil and, and so on. So, the other thing that matters is, is exposure. Exposure is, is key. Um, so if you think about it, a restaurant is an ideal place for that exposure to take place. The, the concept of the sampler that, that, is, that is seen at Villa Campestri, but also at, uh, at Monastrell in, in Spain, um, is, is a very good one, uh, but it is very seldom used because realistically, the challenge is that unlike wine, beer, or, or coffee, olive oil is not a standalone item in a meal. So raising the awareness of the, the flavor the diversity is more challenging than it is to have someone taste a pale ale or a, or a Pilsner lager side by side, or a Cabernet Sauvignon and a Pinot Noir, and quickly realize how different their flavors are. Um, it requires a, a two-step process of tasting the oil by itself, and then tasting the finished dish with that oil. But the choice of the oil becomes a means of customizing and owning the dish that you make, just like choosing the wine or the beer that you're going to serve uh, uh, with a dish. So that's, that's what I wanted to say in, in, in response to the previous question. Now, uh, let's talk about... Uh, the, the, the pairing business. So let, let me start and then I'll turn it over to Gemma. I, 
I like to go back to the idea that any good or sound, meaning extra virgin olive oil, will enhance a dish. That there may be, there may not be that many uh, sensory rules to consider when you pair food with olive oil. Yes, I mean it's true that robust, bitter and pungent oil may not be the best choice for a for a delicate dish with with mild flavors, because it will overwhelm them. Um, and you definitely do not want anything defective to come near your dish. But beyond those hard and fast rules, um, the sky's the limit. A ripe, ripe, fruity, uh, nutty and buttery olive oil will go well with, with pasta, for example. And a green fruit, uh, grassy, tomato leafy and fruity and floral oil will go well with a plate of beans or, or a lemon sorbet. And save that robust oil for a chocolate lava cake and, and a filet mignon, may, uh, maybe. But keep in mind that this is an opinion of one. Uh, we need, we still need to do the research to figure out uh, those olive oil and food pairings uh, or pairing principles, uh, not to take away from from those who started to build those uh, some databases in, in support of those concepts. The principle we are following in our restaurant at Villa Campestri of pairing olive oil and food is uh, the same that you just mentioned. So robust, pungent, uh, bitter olive oil may be not the best choice for a delicate dish uh, with milder uh, flavors because, of course, it over overwhelms it. But, uh, for instance... Um, uh, our olive oil matches very well uh, with uh, um, grilled vegetables with cannellini beans. And what we had last night was uh, an incredible mozzarella di bufala, uh, buffalo mozzarella with uh, um, cuore di bue tomato, uh, which is a spectacular variety of uh, tomato, and uh, Greek basil that I planted uh, uh, this year, this summer. So, for instance, we have um, um, a salad and all kind of milder vegetables that match very well with uh, um, less intense olive oil, with much more fruity olive oil, olive oil that comes from Lago di Garda, for instance, or uh, olive oil that comes from uh, the south. Uh, I, in particular, I love Nocellara del Belice. It has these amazing tomato hints and uh, it really matched incredibly with uh, lots of vegetables. So compared to um, uh, food and wine pairing uh, in, in the field, food and olive oil pairing, uh, there's much less research in my, in my opinion, but some scientists are, are studying hard on the subject and Jean Xavier can tell you much more uh, about these because I know that he is uh, in touch with uh, uh, some research center that do this. So there is a lot of, to discover and a lot of study. Some industries are farther along than others in terms of having fairly well set rules. Uh, think dry white wine like a Chardonnay or a Verdejo with fish and a hearty Burgundy or, or a Pinot Noir um, with lamb or, or venison. Um, but the exploration of pairing concepts is, is really only beginning for, for coffee, for example, as consumers realize that the huge diversity of flavors one can experience with specialty coffee. So I think that the, the olive oil world is, is going to, to get there eventually, but um, I think it's fair to say that it's more focused right now on what are the parameters that need to be at play to produce High quality olive oil, and to and to make a profit at it, the um, the world of chefs and restaurants and, and consumers is starting to talk about what what is the best way to to pair a specific type of olive oil with a with a specific dish. So it's it's happening, but I would like to return to the consumer and state that. What we are observing today is the realization that the consumer should have the final say and that we are all different. Uh, so the pairing that might work for me might not be the one that works for, for Gemma, uh, probably not. Uh, and let's respect and embrace that. So let, let, me, let me go back to the, 
to the original question, which uh, which were for me to react uh, to the flavors in, in Gemma's examples. So let me let me say a little bit about that and why she came up with those. Well, the the flavors in Gemma's examples are congruent, uh, meaning that they go well together as far as our senses and our brain are concerned. But an extra re requirement for the epiphany to happen uh, will almost always be that, uh, that both the dish and the oil be of high quality or delicious to begin with. Otherwise, that epiphany is not going to take place. So both the dishes that Gemma described and, and the olive oil that she suggested pairing with, with that, they are very high quality uh, products. And if you add the right, the right context, uh, the epiphany would be even stronger. Uh, that pleasurable experience will come from all the pieces coming together uh, in the right multi-sensory and emotional experience. In my consumer research model, uh, what we find is that product variables, consumer variables, and context variables contribute equally to the, the consumer's experience. So if we think about whether there are, there are any sensory principles we may follow in, in putting together those olive oil and food pairings, I mean, we, we might have to deconstruct the oil a little bit and, and think about its taste quality. So is it, is it bitter? Um, is, it, is it somewhat sweet? Um, think about its, its chemesthetic properties. Is it pungent or not? Is it spicy? And then there is the, the whole aromatic piece, which is really most of, of what all the oil is going to be, what, what you smell. And so in trying to figure out what kind of pairing is going to work best for a particular oil with a particular food, we need to consider the taste aspect, the, the aromatics, and then the, the potential pungency. And it's fair to say that um, the congruency between specific smells, you know, tomato leaf or buttery or nutty or, um, or uh, woody notes uh, we, will go better with, with different types of dishes, just like different flavor profiles from different wines went best with some selected dishes. So we, we can apply some sensory principles indeed um, to the pairing of olive oil with food. The other thing that we will have to consider is that those flavor profiles are going to change a great deal depending on whether you're just drizzling the oil on, on top of your dish, your salad or, or, um, or your, your grilled steak, or whether you're actually cooking with the olive oil. Because as you cook, uh, a lot of the volatile compounds in the oil are going to evaporate and, and are going to go away. What's going to stay are the taste qualities and the potential bitterness and pungency of the oil. So you also need to consider that. For me, and I'm not saying that because of, of Gemma's presence here, it has almost been those pairings that Villa Campestri pioneered, uh, most likely because all those pieces came together. Uh, the dish, the oil, and of course the context, uh, that, that beautiful Tuscan villa, and most importantly the, the people that I was with when, when, when I tasted those ma magical dishes. But I clearly recall my first experience with uh, Villa Campestri's chocolate lava cake, uh, which is made with, with their oil, which is called the Alzimo, uh, or the pasta that's made with, with chestnut flour uh, and a green and grassy Sicilian oil, or Paolo Pasquale's famous plate of beans with a robust piqual from, uh, uh, from Spain. Uh, more recently, I had a wonderful experience with uh, chef uh, Maria Jose San Roman at Monastrel in, uh, in Alicante in Spain, savoring a lemon ice cream with a delicate green grassy blend of piquale and arbequina, and then a, a caramelized citrus and almond dessert, which I think was made with a coronacio cornicabra olive oil. So these are memories that, that, that will stick forever with me because it was, for me, the right pairing between the oil and the dish, but also because of the context and the people uh, that made the, the experience very special. Well, I think that uh, people um, is more and more interested in um, mm, olive oil and food pairing. And uh, I think this is a beautiful challenge that we are going through. 
um, we would probably need to learn more about it from, you know, from a scientific point of view, because what, what is my experience and what I can bring to you is uh, really a first hand experience, which is very important, but has nothing to deal with numbers, you know, and uh, with a graph or, you know, um, any kind of uh, uh, analysis. So I believe that um, we are really into, into the point where we, we really would need to go farther and maybe try to find a uh, um, beautiful, you know, project you know, to, to study a little bit more scientifically uh, the, the interest of people with uh, food pairing and olive oil. The match that I prefer uh, and this is the ultimate thing is the mozzarella uh, di bufala, buffalo mozzarella with the, uh, our extra virgin olive oil and maybe some slices of tomato. Although it's strange, right? So the the the, the delicate mozzarella with uh, the 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 robust uh, uh, olive oil. Um, well. It, it could sound um, strange, but actually it really works because buffalo mozzarella has this uh, sweet uh, end um, of milk and creamy and round uh, uh, taste. And um, uh, our olive oil is robust. It's really sharp. And this goes very well together. I really like the match um, because, and this is very personal, um, I probably, what I have noticed is that food pairing with olive oil goes very well, robust food with robust um, uh, extra virgin olive oil, but it's not for everybody the same. So for me, uh, the contrast of uh, uh, sweet and uh, uh, sour, it's very interesting. So again, we really should start thinking about, you know, um, giving, um, uh, maybe mm, numbers uh, to all these perception, you know. So to me, it's very interesting, the contrast of sweet and sour. Um, that's why I like mozzarella di bufala with uh, robust uh, uh, olive oil. So in, in thinking about olive oil and, and it, its future, uh, what, what I really love about, about Americans and about Californians in particular is this ability to embrace and try new things. Um, and in thinking about plant forward um, cuisine and, and diets and, and so on, what, what we're seeing in California is, is really um, this huge embrace of this uh, particular diet and, and, and lifestyle. So I, I think um, particularly with Gen Zs and millennials, they're gonna be willing to try um, new things, but they're also gonna be quite demanding. And, and they, they're going to demand the healthy, the sustainable and the delicious. Um, they, they won't take anything less. So I think there is a huge opportunity there for, uh, for olive oil. Uh, as long as we get people to try uh, those, those different olive oils, they, they will come to quickly realize that, that it's healthy, it's, de it's delicious, and, and it's sustainable. And they're going to expect it and, and demand it in, in restaurants and then in also the, the way they're going to be cooking at, at home, particularly coming out of the, the pandemic. Uh, people have uh, th these younger people have have, uh, have gotten into cooking and, and eating healthier and more sustainable, and they've been playing with olive oil and, uh, as as they ma their main source of fat, and um, they've they, they've been embracing those um, those more interesting and higher quality olive oil in, in the process. Gemma. Well, I wanted to share something uh, that happened to me in two thousand nineteen. And um, I had an extraordinary uh, food experience, culinary experience, a uh, culinary adventure maybe in Paris. There is a restaurant um, <laughs> with no menu. Yes, your, 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 your city. <laughs> Sweet Paris. So with no menu um, where they serve dishes um, and you have to guess the ingredients the dish uh, is made. So I clearly remember that I had a mousse uh, that uh, to me 
savor as a gâteau of potato and anchovies, like right away. So you taste it and it was potato and anchovies, full stop. I was sure. And later the, the waiter revealed that the real ingredients were pumpkin. It was a mousse. That was the only thing that it was right. So, But it was pumpkin, corn, mar marinated grape with pastis and you Jean Xavier you can tell better than I what a pastis is so just to go back to the question how not to create um you know an environment that or you know an experience that can intimidate people well I think the experience is to let them try you know to 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 be they have to be the um the the subject they have to be the protagonist of the whole story of the whole experience they have to have a voice they have to be able to talk and to express themselves so in this way it's not intimidating because it's not somebody else saying you gotta like this because it's better because blah 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 it's them explaining themselves and probably going farther in this experience, which is, of course, very personal, again, as I said, but it's necessary, you know, to go farther, to create, uh, um, you know, more attitude to people to buy good extra virgin olive oil and not only rancid or defective olive oil. Yeah, and I, I completely agree with that. And if we think about the world of wine and how this wine and food pairing business has, has evolved. It's been because um, it's been by following consumers' tastes. You know, you, in the end, it's all about the consumer and what they like or dislike. We need to respect that and trust that they're going to make the right, the right choice. If they ask for this, let's give it to them. But uh, <laughs> otherwise, everybody should explore and then combine things. Uh, that makes them happy and, and satisfied. 